Well, Larry Hughes is going to pop out and get the ball. Jordan's going to rub his man off of Leitner and then cut down the center and gets a nice pass from Larry Hughes. All right, everyone, welcome to this week's Believe in Wizards podcast. I'm Matt Moderno. I'm joined by my host, as always, Larry Hughes. Uh, Larry, how's your week been going? Hey, it's going well, man. It's going well. The weather's getting a little nicer, so it's just kind of hanging in there. Today, we're joined by a special guest, uh, Muggsy Bugs, a Baltimore native, where he played on one of the greatest high school teams of all time, in my personal opinion. He was a Wake Forest star point guard, where he led the ACC, or is the all-time ACC leader in steals and assists at the time of his graduation, and then was eventually a lottery pick to the Washington Bullets. Uh, but basically put the Charlotte franchise on the map and played for, you know, 14 years in the NBA. So, Muggsy, thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. I think a lot of people think of you in those uh, Teal Hornets jerseys, but you were, you were actually drafted by the Bullets. Um, what was that like to end up, you know, drafted to the team that was kind of the closest local NBA team to you? I mean, the day I got drafted, of course, it felt like it was the weight of the world was lifted off my shoulders. And, of course, being drafted by the Bullets, you know, it's basically right in your backyard growing up in Baltimore. You know, knowing that you've seen so many games with the Bullets, but never thought that you'll be possibly playing with them. And uh, But having the opportunity to play with the late Moses Malone, uh, may he rest in peace, the Manubo, may he rest in peace, the Bernard Kings, and, you know, at the time, Daryl Walker. Uh, so I had some fun times there. You know, Kevin Lockley was our coach at the beginning of the first 14 games until they uh, – brought in West Unsell to take over for him. So it was great times. Yeah, you just ran past, you know, Bernard King and, and Moses Malone, like, you know, they're just, they just regular people. But, you know, what, what was that experience like? I mean, coming in, you know, early on, I mean, did that, you know, get you off in the, in the right start? Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, back in, in the 80s, as you guys witnessed, as Michael was alluding to some of the things that he witnessed in the locker room, you know, that's some of the things that I witnessed you know, walking in, uh, guys, you know, used to smoke cigarettes at halftime and drink beer. And, you know, as a college collegiate kid coming in, you wasn't, you know, used to that. But just being, you know, toolish by those guys, you know, Moses really took me under his wing. You know, he was my my my, my vet. He got to kind of taught me the things on and off the court with the dudes and the dumps. And, uh, and then, of course, watching Bernard, you know, he was just coming back from off of that major knee injury. You know, so he was kind of wanting to, you know, uh, resurface his, his, his career and kind of let everybody know that he was still capable of going. But, you know, those two guys, I mean, Hall of Famers, you know, you got to, you know, tip your head off to those guys in terms of watching them night in and night out, how they prepared. And that kind of gave me an idea or indication what it's going to take to kind of sustain a long career in the NBA. Charles Barkley recently came out and said that Moses Malone was a big, uh, big mentor for him as well and, and helped him with his career. Was that just kind of his personality to, to help guys and or is that something you kind of sought out as a relationship to? Uh, uh, Moses, Moses was the best. I mean, he was the greatest. He had such a passionate heart, but was very fearless on the court. Um, you know, he was a guy that understood the game and he kind of taught me the, the, the little details about what my strengths in terms of how to cater t- towards it, you know, because he was a guy that loved to get rebounds and he was talking about how the little things that he used to do that tip the ball back to him to add up his stats and rebounds and, you know, just give me little details in terms of how to, you know, as a good little guy to continue to, you know, build up your, your stature and, and gain the respect in the league. Um, and that's the way that, you know, I approached each and every time I kind of played the game and watching that guy like that. I mean, but, uh, he just wanted to pass on that knowledge and I can see why Barkley felt that way. Yeah. Yeah. And just f- feelings and thoughts. I mean, I know that that, you know, you, you didn't, you know, stay there long. You you were in that expansion draft, and you know just thoughts on leaving, obviously hometown and again. Um, you know, what, what's your thoughts on 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 that? I mean, were you you happy? You excited? You wanted something of your own? I mean, what's what's that thought process when you are drafted again? Well, at the beginning, you know, I was a little you know disappointed because you know being a lottery pick, man, drafted number twelve, I felt like you know at especially at the season over, we just lost to Detroit in the playoff, I beat us in, in five games. And uh, they coming back, having your exit meeting, and, and then being told that, you know, we're going to kind of get rid of some of the older guys because a lot of those guys was kind of on the tail end of their career. And we was going to kind of bring some players around you to kind of fit 
you know, the criteria that, you know, that fits your game, kind of up-tempo. And that was being told right at the X meet. But as soon as I got home, getting a phone call from my agent, and, uh, and he was asking me, you know, Muggsy, how do you feel about Charlotte? And I'm like, Charlotte? I didn't know Charlotte was a team. And he said that Charlotte Hornet just became an expansion team, and they've been inquiring about you. They want you. And, uh, and talking just spoke with the Bullocks, and they said they was going to, you know, put you and let you be on the, uh, the non-protected list. And I just told him, I said, well, I just left my exit meeting with them, and they just told me how they was going to, you know, bring in players and get rid of some of the older guys. And then that kind of gave me a little different feeling. I'm like, okay, welcome to the NBA. I'm, I'm assuming, man, you've been told one thing, and here it is, behind doors, another thing is happening. Yeah, I, I think we all, you know, have that, have that moment where we realize you've heard it for so many years, you've heard it so many times, but okay, this is really a business, and this is how – things go. They don't really have to tell you what's going on because ultimately it's a business. So I've definitely had my moments of, of understanding that it's not just about basketball. You can't always believe what you hear because, you know, this is, a, this is a business as they always say. Yeah. And as you know, you experience it and that's the way this thing is. And, and good thing for me, I got a chance to experience that early on. And, uh, and from, from that moment on, I treated it as that, as a business, because I knew that no, in any given moment, uh, you could be said one thing, and again, behind the doors, another thing could be happening. So in order to, you know, make sure that you keep your job, you know, you got to make sure that you continue to serve and continue to make sure that you're out there doing the things that you're capable under your control to make sure that, you know, you can stay as long as you, you're servicing, the, you know, giving them what they want and, you know, and trying to make sure you're benefiting yourself as well. Yes, sir. So then you made it to Charlotte. And, and, and that's, when the, that's when the action, that's when the magic started to happen, you know, with, with Zoe and, and, and LJ. I mean, I remember those days, you know, obviously growing up. Uh, talk to me about, about, you know, just that time and transitioning into a new situation. And I mean, you guys were really popular around, you know, during that time, during that time span. You know, how, how did that feel? It was a great time, you know, and, and, and when Zoe and LJ came, you know, that was the, the beginning of it. You know, it was some you know, some trying times up before then, you know, as an expansion team, you go through your, you know, your wars and, you know, your battles and, you know, your, your, your downs, but that kind of prepared us in terms of putting us in a position to, to acquire those type of players. And uh, uh, LJ came first and then Alonzo. And then when those two was able to come, we were starting to really, you know, put ourselves on that, on that national level, you know, winning 50 plus games every year. Um, and that first year when, uh, Zoe came being able to beat Boston, you know, the first year in the franchise year, um, experiencing being a player, beating a, 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 a established franchise like Boston in the playoff that first time. It was amazing for the city. You know, we had 24,000 fans screaming each and every night. So we was one of the top leading attendants every day and doing the NBA. So you have some special time with Zoe and with Dell at the time, you know, shooting Ben, you know, DC3 back then. So it was some great times back then. Everybody I knew growing up had that, the, the teal Hornet starter jacket. Um, like you, you guys made it cool to, to be that team. That's got to be a pretty good feeling. Yes, the pitch stripe shorts. Yep. <laughs> and, and obviously that was, you know, the time obviously when Mike was, was doing his thing. So we talk about the last dance and, you know, just kind of that time period. I mean, as, as you watch the, the the last dance, and as you think back to you know to that time, do you have a different opinion of of, of MJ? You know, now that you get a chance to, to to look back on it. Well, not the player, and not the person. You know, I knew Mike ever since college days. You know, we played each other uh, two years before he went into the uh, NBA, and then got a chance to witness what he did, what he became in the NBA. Uh, he was just like you know, we were just like everybody else. You know, we ran into the Bulls. And uh, couldn't get past them. At first, it was the Pistons. Then, you know, then it was the Bulls. But Mike was, you know, he behind the scenes, you didn't know in terms of the things was going on internal with the organization, with the with the uh, Scotty situation. And uh, but you knew the type of competitive he was. You know, he was the type of guy that he he wanted to win at all costs, as he said. And you could see that each and every time that he stepped on the basketball court. Um, you know, the skill set was off the chart. You know, he was one of the only guys that had the fundamental as well as athleticism. And with that two combination, it was so polished that where he was able to, you know, facilitate. And back then, you know, we had different rules. You know, it was a little more physical. Uh, you can hand check kind of guy guys in places. 
Um, but he was able to, you know, still become that player. And uh, everybody kind of knew that, you know, every night you, you laced up against him, that's what you was getting. And that was, he wasn't a black cat. He wasn't giving the black cat for nothing. Uh, you guys, both, both you and Larry are, are, you know, two of the top steals guys of, of, you know, your respective eras. Um, and, and during the documentary, you saw uh, MJ basically dismiss Gary Payton's defense. Uh, you obviously went up against Gary a, a lot too. Did, what, what did you think about that moment? Well, you know, that's MJ. You know, of course he's going to laugh at a situation where somebody <laughs> felt like they can, you know, they can contain him because no one could contain him. No one could guard him. No, you know, it was very difficult to guard him with two men as opposed to one. Uh, but, you know, that's GP. GP got pride. You know, he got pride and felt like he did, you know, a good enough job to slow him down, you know, to cause him some kind of, you know, some kind of difficulties in, in just in scoring. Uh, but, you know, that's just how, you know, those two guys, you know, their mindsets are, you know, and that's what it's supposed to be. You know, you feel like, you know, you're capable, even though who he was, you know, MJ, uh, you know, guys didn't back down. You know, a lot of guys just love to compete and talk trash, and GP was one of the best talk tra- uh, trash talkers out there. Yeah, Mo, you used to steal, used to steal that ball, man. You used to steal that ball. So, is is and obviously that's a skill. So, I mean, that's a skill, and I always teach it and, and talk about it as, as a skill. Uh, but what's your, you know, what's your thought process behind still in, still in the basketball? And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit, you know, you know, what my thought process is as well. Well, for me, you know, I was the type of cat that picked you up from 94 feet. You know, guys hated to play against me, you know, because they knew that, that it was going to, you're going to be challenged every given night and every dribble, you know, putting the ball down, you know, because that's where uh, mainly where a lot of my strength was, making you work to get that ball across half course because a lot of guys say, well, shit, if you don't see him, you know, you better pick it up. But, you know, I had I had guys where I, I had a me, uh, uh, little schemes where I can play in front of you or behind you in order to where I kind of create my steal. And in front of you, you know, of course, I'm timing your dribble. You know, guys don't understand. Once the ball go down, you, you can't get it back. So, and as it going down, I'm right there as it, you know, before it even get there. So that was one of my, you know, little things that I do in terms of stealing the ball. And then a lot, and lastly, you know, I should let guys act like they beat me and get in front of me, and I play defense from behind you. And it, did, and it does two things for me. You know, for one, if you're not looking, watching me coming, the ball is gone. And if you decide you had to look and see where I'm at, that means that you're not focusing on what's going on down the court. Time and, you know, it's hard, a little difficult getting to your uh, offense and so forth. So that was some of my little tricks I had to use. Yeah, I, I, was, I was a timer as well. And, and, and I used to count dribbles. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm wondering, you know, I, I kind of learned that from Mookie Blaylock and also from Brevin Knight as, as far as to like, you know, just counting the dribbles and how many dribbles a guy will take when you're pressuring versus how many guys, how many dribbles that guy will take, you know, if you're kind of laying back. And I was able to use my length. Was that, did you learn from anybody or is that something you just picked up? Well, for me, you know, it was difficult because there was nobody out there that, I can kind of compare to, you know, the one that fit me, but it was one guy in my neighborhood. His name was, his name was Dwayne Wood and he went to my high school and he also went to Virginia state and played in, uh, down there in college and played four years. He used to do all that. And that's where I kind of picked up that kind of, you know, defensive, uh, prevalences from and, you know, and knowing him and how he played it, you know, that's kind of where I got mine from. But you mentioned, like, the Mookie Blaylock. People don't remember guys like Mookie Blaylock back in the day. You know, Mookie, myself, and, and, and kind of Stockton, we was the top three from 90 to 94. You know, we was the top three uh, assist still leaders in the league, you know, during that time before, you know, other things started to happen with, you know, my injury as well as with Mookie. So, uh, but, yeah, Mookie Bla- Blaylock, I'm glad you mentioned that name. He was one of the best out, that was out there. Well, I, I came to, to Golden State not soon after you left. So I was there, I guess, you know, 01, you know, in that 01, 02. So I, I actually, you know, I played with Mookie, you know, while Mookie was in Golden State. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Mookie Tay, boy. That was a good name to be mentioned. He was one of the Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Muggsy, I've heard you say in other interviews in the past, or maybe I've read this somewhere, but uh, you always said that you've kind of used your height to your advantage um, or, or tried to use that, you know, as a strength as opposed to a weakness. How, how did you go about that? Is just that a mindset thing or just trying to think the game in a way that, that it makes it tough on other people? Well, I just understood who I was and I knew I wasn't going to be much taller. You know, my family, you know, that tallest of my family was 5'7", so and that was my brother. Mom was 5'1", and 
Pop was only five six, so I knew we was you know I wasn't gonna get much taller. And the way I studied the game and well understood the game and as a point guard, you know how to create, how to make guys around you better, as well as get yours off and and just cause havoc for my opponent. You know, knowing that I had that, you know, my size can kind of play into that, you know, play an advantage. Then why not use it? And you know, being low to the floor, right there close to the ball. You know, I kind of understood where guys were, and anticipation was one of the best things that I had. And so that would allow me to keep being that type of player I became and cause a lot of havoc for my opponents. And just, just to piggyback off of that, you know, Muggs, you know, we hear, hear that little phrase of hard over height. Um, and I work with a lot of young people. I mean, obviously, we tell them to, you know, get good grades and keep growing. And our young people will hear this eventually. What, what, what is your, you know, thoughts on that phrase, uh, hard over height? Well, that's where it is. You know, you definitely got to have that big heart because no one measured that besides you know what's inside. No one can be an expert of it. And that's one of my things my mom always told me as a kid, you know, tired when I was shooting tired. No one can be an expert of your life. No one know how big your heart is. No one know your capabilities. No one know your potential. And at the, kid, at the time, a kid, you don't understand that. It's just coming one end, not the other. But as I got older, it really started to resonate. It started to really understood that, yeah, my mom had a point there. You know, no one really understood how big your heart is and, you know, you know your skill set. And for smaller guys, you know, I always want to tell them we can't play the game the same way. We don't have – we can't play the game the same way as a bigger guard. You know, we have to impact it a totally different way. And that's why a lot of – and I'm waiting for this one five two five three guard come along. You know, we had a couple of them that's out there, but some of them seem to don't want to follow that path and they want to, you know, become that score, you know, and thinking that's the way to impact the game. And for our size, it got to be more than that, you know, defensively, because that's where they're going to come at you at the first and foremost and attack you. And you got to be able to withstand that aspect of it. You got to be able to change it in that way of it and be able to create and, and control the team and control your, you know, and you make guys around you better. At the same time, you got to be able to get yours. So, you know, that's why I try to convey to the smaller guys, we can't play the games the same way as a bigger guard. Just because there aren't sports on right now doesn't mean that there aren't fun things to bet on. If you go to betonline.ag, there are plenty of things that you can do to, to be entertained and, and have some, some rooting interest in uh, and some money behind. You know, everything from esports to American Idol to Big Brother, uh, all kinds of good stuff. There's the, you know, $750,000 poker series that betonline.ag has. So uh, make sure you check them out. Um, with the NBA coming back up, you know, I think there's all kinds of fun prop bets and stuff like that that you can look into. So uh, make sure you use the promo code MYPOD100 to receive a bonus on your first deposit. That's M-Y-P-O-D-100. Again, that's betonline.ag. Please use the promo code MYPOD100. You mentioned, uh, you know, guys that aren't super tall that are that are trying to be uh, more of a scorer. Uh, one of the Baltimore names I can think of is Akil Carr. Have you ever had any interaction with Akil? Absolutely. And that was one of the guys that kind of stood out for me. You know, we called him, they called him the crime stopper. And the minute I saw Akil, you know, I knew his daddy, him and his daddy grew up together. And the day I saw him was over at the state championship in Maryland. Uh, when I went and watched him. As soon as I witnessed, you know, his play, he was excited, electrifying the crowd. But I told him, and when I saw him, I said, next level going to be difficult for him because the things that I saw in him in terms of what he need work on, and I was trying to, you know, convey that to him and trying to, you know, let him know some things that I think he need to work on in order to keep climbing up that ladder. Uh, you know, some things went in one ear and out the other. You know, some guys just, you know, want to do it themselves and do it their way, which I understand, you know, cold hardly. I just try to convey him what I thought would maybe, you know, get him looked at a different way as opposed to, you know, where he's being looked upon right now, a little one-on-one -on -one creative type of player, which is only going to get you so far. You know, you got to be able to do a lot more multiple things in order to get that serious look for someone wants you to run their program and, and really take you up to that next level. Obviously, we talked about Michael Jordan. Uh, you ended up in Space Jam. How did that come about? Was that just knowing Michael for a long time? Or how did how did that call come in? Well, uh, well, we all had the same agent. You know, Michael, myself, Patrick Ewan, uh, and we all had David Falk as an agent. But I think it kind of fit the narrative in terms of how they was trying to put the thing together with Sean Bradley, myself, LJ, and uh, Charles, and, 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 and Mike. So 
it just worked out that way and never knew that it was going to turn out to be one of the, you know, one of the best iconic classic movies of basketball that's out there. So, so did that propel you into your entertainment career? Because you know you you've dropped in on a few other, <laughs> you dropped in on a few other shows. Now, did, did that do it? Did, did that start the itch for you? Well, actually, actually, Al, I, before that, I I did this. Uh, my first episode on on TV was Hang Time. Okay. Which was with uh, my man uh, Anthony Anderson, and from that moment, Hang Time, and then Space Jam came, and then from there, that's been doing. You know, the Joanna man, the Eddie's, the Caribbean enthusiasm and so forth. So we got an opportunity to do some of those things. But yeah, Space Jam was a, was a big one. That kind of, after that hang time, but Space Jam really propelled a lot of the other stuff afterwards. That's what's up. That's what's up. So t- talk to me about them runs out there. Like the, the, the runs that you guys will have. I mean, was it invite only? Was it? You know, was it trash talking? Was it, you know, was it keeping score? I mean, what, what was going on out there? It was big time trash talk. Unfortunately for me, I couldn't play because I just had surgery. And, um, and you know, he actually in the movie, Space Jam, people thought I was walking. I was actually being pulled on a dolly and I was moving my shoulders, act like I was walking. But, you know, of course, I went over to watch the game, had my crutches and so forth, watching the book games and Reg and them boys over there. A lot of trash talking. You know, the boys over there trash talking. Uh, Lord, I remember one time when Lord, Kevin Martin was talking trash, you know, the MJ and now and now of course the MJ got the last laugh and uh and let him know who he who the real deal was. Uh, but it was, you know, you you had who's who was there, the Juwan Howards and of course the Dennis Rodman and all those guys. And during that time Shaq was shooting uh Shazam, which he had just a little court out in the parking lot, so they kinda kidded him on that. So it was some fun times doing that. So speaking of documentaries here a little bit, um, you obviously featured in the Baltimore Boys about your Dunbar High School basketball team. What was that experience like? How did how did that come about? I know there's a, a actually I know there's a book. I have a copy here. It's one of, <laughs> one of my go tos over the last couple of years. The Boys at Dunbar. Um, you know what was that experience like? Somebody coming to you about you know putting your life kind of in feature. I mean, that's awesome, especially, you know, doing it with the guys that you grew up with. You know, Raj and I, I mean, we've been knowing each other since we were five years old. We lived in the same neighborhood and uh, in Lawfare Project. And, and David and Raj, they lived up the street in, in, in Cecil Kirk. So, uh, but unfortunately enough for us, you know, this neighborhood, I mean, Dunbar was right in our neighborhood. So it was right across the street. And that's where a lot of the talent went to. And, uh, and we was there, and, you know, we was able to do some great things. You know, and unfortunately for our, our buddy Reg, you know, he, he may rest in peace. You know, he wasn't able to be here to, you know, take part in that. Um, but, you know, it was more or less for our coach, you know, for Coach Wade. You know, Coach really deserved all the credit because he uh, he had to deal with a lot back then. You know, a lot of us was coming from, you know, a lot of challenges, uh, households. You know, dad's one in there for most part of it. And he became father figures for all of us. And to keep us off the street and keep our mind kind of, you know, in the right direction, being, a, you know, thinking as a student athlete, you know, and knowing how he experienced that being a former professional athlete, you know, we kind of understood and kind of followed his lead. And, you know, because, you know, the neighborhood that we grew up in, it was it was challenging. So uh, he really kept his focus and we was able to stay, you know, on path, on task and, and go to, you know, the university and then, then on uh, do something special, making it history in 87 with all three of us. Myself, the David, uh, the late Reggie Lewis, uh, did, and uh, Reggie Williams uh, got drafted in the first round that first year, which David Wingate was already at Philadelphia at the time. Yeah, Mo, you, you mentioned that you, you do some community speaking. You know, you talk about, you know, those Dunbar teams and those guys that, you know, well-accomplished guys. Like, w- what's your message to the young people that are, you know, growing up in those same parts? Uh, obviously, th- those same housing projects may not be there, but you know the, the same community is. So, like, what's your what's your message like to, not just to the basketball players, but just like to the youth, like to create a successful conversation or you know journey for them. Uh, first and foremost, you know, I hope they have confidence within itself uh, because that's where it starts. Um, and a lot of guys and a lot of girls are going through trying situations. You know, growing up in those type of atmosphere, you no know, telling what's going on in the household. And I just want to hopefully that it can find some kind of safe haven where they can believe in themselves to where they can kind of dream and visualize what they want to be in life. Because that's where it starts, you know, dreaming out of that atmosphere that we're in and, and thinking of something that's more bigger and better that, 
you know, that we're in right now. And, and it's possible because, you know, they've seen, they got testimony for a lot of people that came through those type of uh, situations and hopefully that they can, you know, have someone that give them that type of shelter where they can, you know, reach that full potential because we got so many talented, talented kids that's growing in those uh, situations that the only thing they need is resources and a little helping hand. And sometimes they don't have it. And hopefully, you know, when I was growing up, you know, we always said took a village and raise the kids and which it was. And hopefully that we can continue to have that same type of model where, you know, when we see these kids in situations like that, where we can kind of keep encouraging them. Cause that's all they need. Someone saying that you can be that, whatever that you current in that thought process in your head, you know, you can be that, just stay on path, stay on task, and that dream will come true. You know, we can, if they hear that more and more, you know, eventually, you know, their dreams will come true. Yeah, and, and, and Matt, we started this deal as a, as a Wizards podcast to talk about, you know, the ins and outs of the game and the X's and O's and, you know, roster moves or this and that. But with, with the, the state of, you know, the world, you know, where we're living in, it's good to, to get this message out. So appreciate you, you know, coming on and giving that message because people are listening, right? That's that's really all that they have to do is is, is to listen. So uh, making sure that we're putting positive content out there, um, you know, people that we can recognize. I mean, everybody knows mugs. Everybody, you know, you can walk in any room and they know exactly who that guy is. It's not because of size. So shout out to you, man. Appreciate you for for giving those words. Oh, my blessing, my brother. And I'm glad you guys are using this platform. And that's what we got to do. Continue the platform that we own. We got to use to keep spreading that message. And the more they hear it from us, the more they understand that, you know, someone like them is in that position that they can possibly be in that same position. So shout out to you and Matt. And I appreciate you guys having me on, you know, being able to be part of this. Obviously, the the height thing comes up all the time. I'm sure you're probably sick of, of talking about it to some extent. But you know, you're, you're from a tough area and, and you've talked about, you know, you got shot when you were uh, about five years old. I mean, you, you have an unbelievable story. So it, I think it's like Larry said, it, it's great for people to get to hear that. And obviously have three high school teammates that obviously, you know, made it, made it to where they wanted to go, accomplished their goals. Um, you know, before Reggie Lewis's tragic passing, he was on that way, but what, what does it take? Is that, um, did you guys help propel each other to that point? Is that kind of getting lucky with having the right people in your ears to kind of push you in that direction? Like what, what are the components for that? I guess. Well, absolutely. You know, it, it also starts from the home, but again, it's coach way, you know, coach gets a lot of credit for that, uh, keeping us on, on task because he had to deal with a lot of egos. I mean, we had egos back then, you know, we all came from different recreations uh, programs where well, we all felt like we was the best. And then all of a sudden we coming as one unit, he had to make that work. And uh, we had uh, so many guys, not only myself and the David Wingate and the two Reggies, the late Reggie Lewis and Reggie Williams, but we had so many guys that became so successful in life afterwards that didn't play basketball. You know, the Daryl Woods and the Tim Dawson, the, the Keith James and the, the Gary Grant. I could keep going on that coach had influence on that team because a lot of us, you know, we went to Division One schools, you know, 11 of us, you know, out of the 15. And having that type of, you know, you know, understanding that we all wanted something more than life. And Coach kind of, you know, gave us that understanding and made that thing possible. So, you know, that's where it really stems from, you know, knowing that, you know, we wanted something more out of life. We had someone that kind of gave us a platform and gave us a, a, a kind of a guide on how to get there. And we just kind of, you know, followed it all the way, you know, until this day. Uh, we had Walt Williams on last week, who obviously played for Bob Wade a little bit at Maryland and had nice things to say about him too. And, uh, you know, as a Maryland fan growing up, I, I kind of, all I knew about Bob Wade was how it ended. So it, it's, I think it's important for people that don't know that story to, to know a little bit more about his background and what he did for people. Yeah. Yeah. I told him don't go to Maryland. <laughs> I told him don't go to Maryland. It was a lot of other things. Some, you know, one reason why we didn't go to Maryland, you know, because of uh, some things that happened, but, you know, Coach, you know, like I said, Coach, I always love a challenge. Uh, Muggsy, just one or two more questions, if you don't mind, before we get you out of here. Just a couple uh, things I, I was curious about. Um, you know, anytime you watch a highlight reel of yours, one of the things that comes up is, is that big block on Patrick Ewing. What, what does that feel like to have one of your, you know, more famous uh, career highlights be a block of somebody? 
Well, it's good to see. Well, actually, during that game, I told him he was going to be on the highlight film anyway. Yeah, uh, for whatever reason, I, I just mentioned that because, you know, the friendship that we have. You know, you're just being at the right place at the right time, you know, just competitive basketball, just trying to do whatever it takes to win, man. That's what it was back then. And, you know, uh, you know, it was a, a real instinctive moment. You know, I had to react. So, fortunate enough, I was able to get one. Did, did, did you talk to him, Muggs? You know did, I did. Did you talk to him? You know yes, I did. Sir. I yes, him. sir. I told me, he was on my, you gonna make my highlight feel. Big fella didn't like that either, but. <laughs> yes, sir, you got that one. <laughs> you know. Yeah. What you up to, big fella? What you been doing in uh, in St. Louis? Oh, man, I'm uh, just living, man, enjoying the family. Uh, I'm in the basketball game, so I have a program. Uh, we teach skill development, um, fundamentally based. I mean, we're working from them from, the time where they can just barely walk up into, you know, that quote unquote elite status, uh, just giving them the tools, the basketball IQ. Um, you know, we've, we've built a facility here that uses some technology, um, catches the shooting accuracy and their performance movements. So really trying to create that efficient uh, workflow, um, you know, using, you know, our, our skills that we have as coaches to, to give them the eyeball test. But a lot of these kids now they want to they want to know the why they want well okay why is this happening or why am I not getting the results so we use that technology to show them hey you're only shooting a hundred shots a week you know this is this is really the results of that so really just staying you know just staying in tune with the game I got you know a son that's playing um, so he keeps me busy within the game and you know trying to trying to step out of the box doing a little bit of podcasting and and having some fun with it man having some fun with it. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. And, and I tell yeah. you, especially with this AAU stuff that's happening, they, they need exactly what you're doing. Uh, they need that that true instruction, you know, that true information. Because a lot of them, as you know, I mean, the kids that we see today, even in the NBA, you know, they, they still a little lost. They're not polished, yeah. you know. And that's what we talk about, that fundamental part of it, you know, understanding how to be able to combine the two, the athleticism as well as the – the combination with the fundamentals, which a lot of them are still lacking. And because the AU is just all about game, game, games, and no development. And uh, so it's, uh, it's great to see you here that, you know, you're putting back and spreading that knowledge. And I'm quite sure your son has really benefited from it as well as everybody else. So shout out to you, my brother. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Uh, Muggsy, how about you? What are, what are you doing? Are you involved with the game at all still? I know you've done some coaching and stuff in the past. What, what are you up to these days? Yeah, I've done, you know, I've done the high school coaching. I coached the WNBA and uh, uh, now currently doing, uh, serving as an ambassador for the NBA as well as the, uh, the Hornets. Um, you know, so of course we all shut down right now, but do a lot of speaking engagement. I got a foundation, the Muggsy Book Family Foundation, where we have a scholarship program for uh, these vocational aspirational kids, you know, a lot of people kind of cater towards the IT kids. And I wanted to give a little more resource to the kids that have that vocational hands-on type of experience still, you know, and, and make sure that they still fulfill their aspiration and their dream. So me and my daughter and family created this scholarship. So mainly, you know, keeping that going and just doing a lot of community active work and just staying busy. My grandson, and, you know, he's playing ball. And now that, you know, his school is out, kind of limit my, you know, going to see him and traveling. But other than that, just staying home and trying to stay safe and listen to all the local officials and, you know, and just maintain, you know, the social distance as I was waiting until we get back to, you know, some sort of normalcy and, you know, we get back going again. Absolutely great. Uh, it's both, you know, both you guys giving back to the game is important. I think um, you, know, you both have interesting stories and came from, from tougher backgrounds coming up. So it's really important for, for people to hear that. And we appreciate you sharing that with us today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, Larry, got anything else on your list here? No, no. Just, again, appreciate you. And, um, you know, I'm in the, in the space, so if you can call on me for, for any sort of support and anything that you're doing, um, I'm available. I'm my available, brother. so don't hesitate. For sure. I'll definitely reach out, Al. I'll definitely reach out. Good seeing you, man. Good talking to you, too, bro. Good to see you doing well, man. Keep doing your thing. Matt, thank you again. Appreciate you, buddy. All right, everyone, that was our interview with Muggsy Bogues. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, you know, we, we've been trying to keep these things uh, focused as much on the Wizards as we can. And, and obviously, since Muggsy was a bullet, um, you know, he's still popular in the area. And, you know, Charlotte's a reasonably close uh, uh, region to ours. So thought it was a good time to kind of bring him in, get a little feedback. And 
hear his story. So, uh, you know, everybody kind of in the Baltimore DC area is, is going to be familiar with that. And we, we hope everybody got something out of it. So, um, let us know if you got any other suggestions for guests that we can have on or, or people to, to line up and, uh, you know, make sure to spread the word, share the podcast with people, find us on social media. It's believe B L E A V in wizards on every social media platform you can find Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff. So, uh, we'd love to hear from you and, We'll have another good episode for you ready, uh, ready to go next week.